Hi there, I'm Lisa Myers Bullnash. I am a visual artist and my main mediums are collage, assemblage sculpture, which is basically 3D collage. And I alter existing books to create new works of art. I've been showing my work professionally since around 2010. And I am really proud to say that some of my exhibits have included uh, making work for the Liberty Bank building apartment complex in Seattle. Uh, that is an apartment complex that sits on the site of the former uh, Liberty Bank, which was the first black owned bank west of the Mississippi. Uh, I have also uh, put together some work uh, that is currently on display um, in a couple of places. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Uh, Wanawari is one of the places where that where my solo work is up on display. And there's also an altered book that I created for the Like Mother exhibit at the Vashon Center for the Arts. So let us get started and see what we've got going here. So um, as you meant, as you might have noticed, uh, I mentioned a couple of places that are located in Seattle where I like to exhibit my work. And those two, Wanawari and also the Liberty Bank building, um, those are located in the central district of Seattle, which is the traditional historic heart of black Seattle. It's been heavily gentrified, so it doesn't look like it used to, but it is still the place that people think of when they think of black Seattle. And for this reason, in centering African-Americans and African-American heritage, I like to use um, old fashioned images and photos that are centering black people because I feel like if you see a black person who is appearing in a, in a vintage shot or something important, it should not be any more surprising than if you saw someone who is white or someone who's Asian or someone who's Latino. So this project we're gonna work on today is to create a gel skin, what's called a gel skin. And you see that this gel skin I've made today is really thin. It's pretty translucent. So you can see stuff that is behind it, as well as the image itself. And I'm going to show you how to make one of these. It's actually really easy. Probably the most important thing is having patience in this process. So I will set this aside and we'll get to it. So I'm gonna tilt my camera on my laptop. So be careful for the be careful for the people who get easily seasick. <laughs> okay. There we go. That should do it. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is pick your image. I suggest picking an image that has a lot of contrast and uh, plenty of white space. It doesn't have to be actual white space. It's just an area of the image that allows the eye to sort of rest, like the, the dress and the blouse of the teacher and the student. Uh, it's good to have a high contrast because that way the black and white of your 
image transfer will stand out and tell the eye that it's the most important thing to be looking at in your collage. And the way you start these is after you've printed this out, you coat it with matte medium. We're gonna start with that. And we are also going to figure out which tools we really need. So besides the matte medium, I usually use um, a fairly wide tipped brush um, in order to apply the matte medium to the image. You could do it with a smaller brush, like say something more like this, or even something, even a brush as small as this one, but I wouldn't recommend it because it will take you longer to get done what you wanna get done. All right, at, some, at a later point, we're going to use regular gel mat. And this is essential, this has essentially the same purpose and use as the matte medium, but this one is obviously more liquid. And this one is what I, what I would call drier. Um, it's definitely something that you spread on rather than pour on. And this one can be useful for pieces that you want to attach that may smear a little bit, or they may need, uh, they may need a really dry glue in order to set something very delicate. All right, and so we got that, got that, a brush. Later on, we will need a sponge, water container, and let's get started. So, matte medium is essentially clear acrylic paint. So it acts like a paint, but it also acts as an adhesive. When you start coating your, cop your copy, you're going to do it in several directions. Oh, I should also mention that when you have a copy ready to go to be coated, it should be a toner copy, not an inkjet copy. Inkjet will smear on you. Um, and sometimes that's what you want it to do. But most of the time, that kind of control just disappears if you use an inkjet pr printer and the image won't be as sharp when you're finished. So you see that I am taking on another direction. I went horizontal first, now I'm going vertical. Just turn the page because it's a little easier to control that way. And let me see who is participating today. I'm gonna open up my chat and see who I can see. All right. All right, well, you know what? Feel free to ask me questions as I go along. Depending on what you're doing with your matte medium and what you're applying, you may wanna just put the matte medium in a separate container. Uh, for this kind of thing, since I'm not really moving any color around, I prefer to just dip into the actual bottle. Okay. Let me show you something you want to try and avoid. Okay. So you see how thick that particular brush stroke is? You don't want it that thick and you definitely don't want this very obvious line at the edge of the brush stroke. Instead, what you want to do is spread it around a little bit more. Just a few strokes will usually decrease it right away. And so when you get more 
matte medium out of your container or the bottle, you can start with a semi full brush and then spread that around your image. I'm gonna put four to six coats of matte medium on this page. You definitely want to have at least four. I prefer to use six because what you're doing with the matte medium is you're essentially creating a web of layers of matte medium that will capture the toner ink. And you don't want all the layers going in the same direction because that would make it easier for the gel skin to tear. So there's another diagonal. So vertical, horizontal, diagonal both ways. And then another couple of horizontal and vertical stripe, uh, coats. So you might have noticed that I have something underneath is actually more copies. Generally, when I'm making a gel skin, I make at least two copies. Sometimes I'll make three or four. And that is because if this one doesn't work, this one might. Or if that one doesn't work, I still have a third option. Also, when you coat each one in one sitting, it is easier to allow the layers on the first and then the second to dry while you're working on the third. So I just keep on going vertical, 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 horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. So let's set this one aside for a bit. Oops, go. It's also important not to get matte medium on the back of this image because this, the whiteness, the white paper is gonna go away. And if you have matte medium on that back, it makes it that much harder to remove the paper. I think you probably get an idea of what I'm talking about here. So let's say that I have done finish this one and finish this one and finish this one and I'm still waiting for it to dry. Here's the most important thing. Leave it alone. Go away. Leave it alone. Let me rephrase that. Leave it alone. You need to step back and let the matte medium set and hold on to bond to the toner ink. Otherwise, you're going to get slippage, you're going to tear stuff, just leave it alone. It's best if you leave it alone overnight. You could make it a little shorter than that, but it really is a better idea to do it overnight. And that way, by morning, you will have a well-coated image and a dry, uncoated opposite side. So now here's where the magic happens. Okay. Let's see. Okay, let me look at the chat. Uh, you, okay, let's see. Susan Pasillo, or Pasillo, sorry about that if I got it wrong, asked why we applied in different directions. Just to reiterate, if you have the layers stacked in different directions, then it creates a web. If you have everything this way, for example, and you try to rub away the paper on the back, then you are much more likely to tear the image because all your fibers, all your layers are going the same way. If you had another direction or five more directions like I usually do, that reduces the chance of the 
gel skin tearing. And just to show you it one more time, you see how delicate that is. It's really thin, it's translucent. So you wanna be careful of this, even though it doesn't really take <laughs> brain surgery or rocket science to make it. Okay, so let's let's get this party started with the other side. Let's pretend that you have been waiting and waiting and waiting eagerly and you finally went to bed because you just couldn't stand the excitement and it's morning and you get to rub away the paper from the back so you can create that translucent gel skin. I usually use, I usually start with a sponge um, and I use that for the large areas. And then when I'm getting more detailed, like for an eye or for uh, a particular set of small elements in the image, I use my finger. You can use your fingers for the whole thing. And that's how I used to do it when I first learned this technique. But I have decided that that's not really great for me because after so much rubbing and rubbing and rubbing, after a while, I get that weird feeling in my fingertips where it feels like I'm still rubbing something or there's still friction against my fingers. So this reduces that possibility. Okay. So the paper I'm using, uh, Chris Frasson Straukas, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, asked what type of paper I'm using. Um, I'm just using regular printer paper. Uh, the weight is more important than the look, I guess. I try to use printer paper that's uh, at least 40 pound weight. Uh, you will see that measurement, that, um, that weight measurement on the package when you pick up the stack of printer paper. So look for 40 or 70 or 80, 100. The higher the number, the stiffer the paper. So when you're working with, for example, uh, cardstock, that is usually around 140 pounds. And this is, cardstock is not what we wanted to hear because we are getting rid of paper. Okay. So it is important to make sure that you don't let the matte medium dry in your brush. Um, you can just have it soak up to the ferrule. This, this part is called the ferrule. These are the fibers. You can soak it up until there um, while you are working. And that way it keeps it moist until you can get back to a sink of some sort and pour out the water that has matte medium in it and clean the brush. If you do not clean your brush or at least put it in water, keep it damp while you're working on the rest of it, while you're working on the rest of the project, it will dry in the shape that you left it and you will not be able to revive that brush for further use. So it's always a good idea to have water standing by. Doesn't matter too much that I am dipping into water that has matte medium in it because eventually I will clean that out and I will use lukewarm or cool water to rub away the rest of the paper. Okay, so I've rubbed away a significant amount. And you see the image is starting to come through. 
gradually. Just scoop these out of the way with the opposite side of my sponge because the rough side seems not to pick things up as easily as the soft spongy side. Okay. Let's see, memory quilts. Someone asked about memory quilts. Thank you, Margaret. How do you transfer to fabric? There are actually spe special pages that you can buy in a place like blick.com or at a craft store that are made specifically for transferring images to fabric. You can do it with a method that's similar to this, but if you want something really clear and crisp and opaque, I would really suggest that you use one of the specialty products that's designed to transfer the image onto fabric. Okay. Okay, so this is the point at which I start rubbing with my finger, especially at the faces. You might be, be able to see that the teacher is becoming more translucent as I move my finger, my thumb behind her. So this is the point at which I rub in small circles gently on the gel skin. You want to be gentle with it because like I said, gel skins are delicate. And if you rub too hard or you rub too much in one direction, eventually you will tear the gel skin. That might be your purpose because sometimes you might want an image that looks distressed, something that looks like it's been beat up. But in this case, I think it's not such a good idea. Okay, so her face is starting to come a little bit more clear. And on the other side. I would also suggest being careful about doing the edges of your gel skin for the same reason. Unless you really, really want to rip it or you want a ragged look, you want to be very delicate, you want to be gentle with the edges so that you don't tear them, so that they don't break. Okay, so let's start revealing more of this image. If you're wondering where I found this image, you can find this at, in the Library of Congress in its prints and photographs division. They have all sorts of really cool images from the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, 21st. And because it is a US government resource, many of the images in the Library of Congress are copyright free. That means if you decide that you want to take an image and make a piece of art with it, if it's copyright free, knock yourself out. There may be some rights restrictions and some usage restrictions, so you do have to research that. But in general, the Library of Congress is one of my favorite sites to visit because of the variety and because of the copyright free nature of so many images. So we're going a little bit on the edge here. Okay. So this is 40 pound weight paper, I believe. 
And this is a favorite to use of mine because it's heavy enough that it feels like it'll hold up to a little bit of manipulation <laughs> or abuse if I need to, but it's not so thick that I can't actually get through it or cut through it easily. Okay, let's see if there are any other questions. Okay, okay. So, looks like somebody asked, does it work with colored prints? Must the contrast or shadows or saturation be increased for better results? Uh, I do tend to increase the contrast if possible, especially with the older photographs from like the 1860s, maybe the 1830s, and also with line drawings or engravings, because although they're scanned accurately, it just makes the image pop out more strongly against your collage if you have high contrast. You can do this with colored prints, but again, the print needs to be toner copies. You don't want to use inkjet. The lovely thing about matte medium is that you can coat something that might smear a little bit and keep it in place. So I don't generally use color prints for this technique. I add the color later, either in a collage or with paint or with watercolor crayons. So if you had an image like say, the image of the migrant mother by Dorothea Lange, that's that depression era photograph of the woman who's sitting with her chin in her hands while her kids are looking over her shoulder. And it's from when the Midwest was becoming the dust bowl and people from Oklahoma and places nearby were moving to the coasts because the land was all dried up. They were looking for jobs. If you used Migrant Mother, that would be a good one because it has lots of white space. There's, there's lots of, let's see. So if we're looking at the teacher's face, there's lots of white space, relatively speaking, for this image. Her forehead, her cheeks, a little bit of her chin. That's the same situation with Migrant Mother. So the more white space you have, even if the skin color is darker, the better you'll be able to see both the image and whatever you put underneath the gel skin. Okay. So, okay. So if I've got another question that says, oh, does the final product fade over time? Not if you take care to seal the final product. Um, you can do that with matte, with more matte medium or with regular gel matte. I prefer gel matte um, it's just a personal preference because I like to control the amount of shine in an image. And if I want to add more, that's always easier than <laughs> taking stuff away. There are also lots of useful tips on the Golden Paints website about how to use their products and how to and which products work best for sealing images. You can transfer transfer images to a tile 
but it's a little bit different. It's not going to, it's probably going to have a thinner film of an image. Any tile that is somewhat porous, like brick, you know, you can see the little holes in brick or in tile. If it's porous, it will probably accept a liquid or an ink that's been captured. So you can do that with tile. All right, and here goes another one of those corners. All right. Now, because I'm not terribly worried about keeping this image pristine. If I happen to tear off a little bit, I'm not gonna worry about it. One of the lovely things about collage is that it does not have to be perfect. And sometimes the, the imperfections are more interesting than if you had done it to a measure of exactitude. All right, here's the edge. This is where I go in with my fingers because I don't want to tear the edge in particular. Okay, so I'm just spreading the water. And now I'm rubbing in smallish circles or ovals. You can see the difference between this corner, for example, or this corner to this one, which is still fairly opaque. And this one really hasn't been touched yet. Let me know if you have any more questions. I am checking the chat to answer more questions. So fire away. Okay. okay, so now we're getting down to more detail work. In just a few moments. This is when you'll be removing the less obvious pieces of paper. The stuff that comes up in teeny little pills rather than these big ones that you're seeing. So, every once in a while I like to check and see how the faces are looking. So most of the faces are looking pretty good. The little girl on the end could use a little bit more work for sure. And because her face is small and it's an important part of the picture, I'm going to use my finger in circles, rubbing in circles. Okay. <laughs> Got a little bit of discarded paper underneath that. All righty then. So, and while I'm rubbing, I am thinking about which papers I want to use in the collage that will go underneath this gel skin. It is very helpful to pick two or three colors rather than go to town with the whole red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple spectrum. Because color, as you have probably noticed, creates a mood and helps to tell whatever story or narrative you have in mind for your collage. Right now, because this is a classroom scene, but the kids look pretty intense and focused 
on what they're doing at the table, the activity they're doing at the table, I am thinking that maybe I could use some blues and some greens to convey a sort of serene situation, a more serene and calm atmosphere. But of course, these are kids. So I will probably have a contrasting color to go with that in some places. If you're not sure which colors to use, I would suggest picking up a pocket color wheel or you can get the ones that are a little bit larger. These usually tend to go fast, <laughs> but either way, what you wanna do when you're picking your colors, say you wanna do blue. Okay, so you line up the empty space on the blue and then you follow the arrows to see which colors would work best with these shades of blue. So the direct complementary color for blue is orange, some shade of orange. You could also use yellow orange or red orange. And if you're feeling pretty inv really adventurous, you could use a shade of green or shade of purple. That is a tetrad color, which means that it's a little bit further down on the scale in terms of how it will please your eye. The complementary colors and the primary colors, red blue, red, blue, and yellow, are the ones that draw your eyes first. And then to a lesser extent, the greens, the purples, the oranges, and so on. So, pretty much done here. You can see that there is still a little more fuzziness, a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a, hmm, kind of looks like that little fuzz, visible, visual fuzz that you see on blueberries in the summer. You can rub away a little bit more of that, but don't worry about getting it like as clear as a window. Um, first of all, it's not going to do that. And second of all, when you use matte medium to glue it down to your collage scraps, then a lot of this will disappear. Set this aside and now I will take a look at some of the scraps that I've collected. I decided to make my collage on watercolor paper. That way I can glue scraps on there, or I could do something like adding color using water-soluble crayons. Um, these are made by Karen Dosh, and they're, <laughs> they're the good stuff. I really love these things. Ooh, ah, look at all the options. Ooh. So I think since I am going with blue, I might use a purple or I might use, that's maybe an olive, a darker green. I tend to gravitate to the richer colors. Oh, pro tip. When you are working with water soluble crayons, it's a good idea to just close the container every time you take something out and put something back in because they are water soluble. And if you spill this all over this crayon, you are gonna get a great big blob of color that you can't use but once. 
All right, so let's put that aside. Okay, now let's take a look at some scraps. All right. So as I said, I'm going to use, I'm gonna use blue predominantly. Oh yes, so uh, somebody wants to know, uh, somebody has asked me to repeat again, how do you know when to stop? You, you know when to stop when the image is more, is fairly see-through. Um, give it maybe five minutes, walk away from it for maybe five minutes. And if it still looks cloudy, then rub a little bit more with your finger to get rid of the cloudy bits. You see how this still has paper on it, but I'm not worried about it because this is the level of paper thickness that will basically disappear into the background once I start using the matte medium to adhere it to the collage. So, hmm. we've got the kids here. I'll probably center them right about there. And now begins the process of just playing around with placement of the scraps. So I might use the large blue piece like at the level of the table and lower. And just for fun, I would probably introduce this scrap of Japanese paper that has a wave print on it. Scraps are useful. Scraps are my favorite. You can also use the origami papers that come in packs where they'll have it all color coordinated for you. So you don't even really have to think about how you're going to match things up. It's just up to you. And it helps to use white or cream behind darker spots to bring to bring that more to focus. For example, comparing this little girl's face to the teacher's face. The teacher's face is easy to see. It really doesn't matter what I put under her face. Her face, if I'm not careful, she'll just fade into the background. So I'm definitely going to put some white or some cream behind her face. Oh, got another question. Um, if you're collaging onto dark background, what are your tricks for detecting haze on the skin? I'm a little uncertain about what you mean when you say haze on the skin, but I'm sure that you can clarify as I'm working. Okay, so. Because I just feel like it, I am going to mostly rip these papers. Squirt with my fingers, just like they taught you how to do in elementary school, and tear it. I prefer a less sharp edge most of the time because then it doesn't really then it doesn't distract as much from the gel skin. So, let's see. And to show you an example of how you can create mood and atmosphere with these colors, um, I'd like to show you this picture of the singer Billie Holiday. Uh, you've probably seen this image before. This also is in the Library of Congress, but it does have some restrictions on its use. Not for education though. You see that I have a red and cream pattern paper highlighting her face and her throat and, um, and her decolletage while a darker, a darker series of greens are coming this way. And I created a sort of gardenia to put in her hair. 
Billie Holiday was known for performing with a white gardenia tucked into her hair. And she's also known for having a pretty tumultuous life. So that's why I chose the patterned red paper because there, there's a lot going on here, but it's still a big enough pattern so that you can see the outlines of her eyebrows and her lips and her, and her jawline. And I don't mind this sharp line that runs between the red and the green because of Billie Holiday's reputation as somebody who had a very hard life. So I think of this part as the part she shows to the audience and this part uh, is sort of the backstage part of her life. And you don't have to put all the collage materials underneath the gel skin. As you see, I put this one on top and I used this one, the red and orange paper that I still have some of to suggest the song coming out of her mouth and the passion and intensity with which she sang. Okay, so I'm going to collage this directly onto the back of the gel skin. So just a little bit, a little bit goes a long way. And all right. Okay, so this is a good example. All right, you see these blue fibers that are coming loose? There's also a little bit of blue dye that's coming off. So I'm gonna put this to the side and I am going to pull out the regular gel. And we're going to use a palette knife to scoop this out and apply it. All right, smooth it thinly. And then, Position it as you would like. I recommend smoothing it out from the center. And let's see, so we still have a wave paper. Let's see. Why don't we put the wave paper, uh, huh. Right about, you know what? I've got a better idea. Let's put down the paler pieces so that I know I will be able to highlight the faces of the darker people in this picture. I tend to hold this stuff up to the light to make sure it's going where it needs to go. So I'm going to tear off this edge. A little bit more, yeah, that'll do. All right, yeah. Okay, and I am pasting this across three kids actually. Their skin is darker than the teachers and they're also wearing dark clothes. So the cream or the white will help their skin show up better. Okay, let's see. And also this little girl, this little firecracker over here. Okay. I did see a comment and I'm going to look a little closer at it, just a second. Okay. I'm going to align this with the line of her dress. Okay, so you were saying, can you please turn the label of the second product to camera? Yes. Okay, 
You can find all of these products um, on my bundle page on Blick.com. I'll remind you a little bit later to go over there and my friends behind the camera are going to put that web address in the chat. So don't worry if you're having trouble keeping up or if you got distracted. You see how the darker skin shows up a little bit better? You can see more detail. And this is one of those old pictures where it, you just have to accept a certain loss of detail as sort of part of, <laughs> part of the danger of working with this particular element. So again, smoothing the gel medium. Let's see. Hmm. Hmm. Let's Mm, yeah, I think I'm actually going to have it go down like this. And then stick that down. Okay. So, how about some green? That would be a good thing at this point. Where did I put my green? Ah, here we are. <laughs> I still have lots and lots of green from the previous project with Billie Holiday. And I think I'm going to use both sides. This is double sided. So I think I'm going to use the pattern as well as the solid color, just for kicks. All right, where should we put that? I'm one of those people who places things first to see where I'm going. There are some things, there are some projects at which I'm willing to just kind of wing it and see how it turns out. But if I can figure out what it's gonna look like beforehand, if I can sort of predict what it's gonna look like beforehand, I'd rather do that. Okay. Let's see. Once again. Okay. Besides using my fingers to press this down, brushing out from the center, sometimes I will also use a brayer. This Brayer is, if I remember correctly, actually used for Sumi ink, but I like it because the rubbery part is more forgiving when I am taking down papers onto something as delicate as a gel skin. Okay, you can see some of the green and white pattern starting to show up in the kids' pinafores. And let's see. So I did promise that I was going to add a little bit of excitement because there is no such thing as an elementary classroom that doesn't have some kind of excitement. So let's use one of these scraps. I think I want to use the red and orange side rather than the orange side. Okay. okay, so I'll just clip those together so I can keep track of them. And a little bit more of the matte medium, Oop, I should say. Gel medium. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Let me see. 
about these two, these two little firecrackers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get another little piece and put it up like a flame. Oopsie. <laughs> if you don't end up with glue on your hands at the end of the project, what in the world were you thinking? Get into it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is really showing up. Okay, let's, let's put it there. All right. Oh, you may have noticed that there's this plastic that I have inside the gel medium. I pat it down and I store it kind of like saran wrap on top of the gel because if once you start using the jar, of course, you're going to have air left the more that you use it and the air will dry out the gel medium and there is no way to bring that back once that happens. <laughs> Believe me, I've tried. Okay, all right, so this is starting to look like something interesting. Let's throw a little bit of the uh, watercolor crayon on. Let's see. Let me do it up at the top. Okay, now you have two choices on how to use the crayon. You can rub it in, you can rub it into the paper with your finger, with the oil on your finger, because that will heat it up, the friction will heat it up and it will smear in an interesting way. Or you can use water to spread it around. So I'm just going to spread this quickly because we're getting close to the end of the time here. Thanks for sticking with me. All right. Lots and lots of color. Okay. And now I am going to use <laughs> another brush, a clean brush, to get the matte medium onto the back of the gel skin. Again, thin layer, try to get rid of any lines, any really thick lines. Okay. All right. Okay, so positioning. I tend to stand up when I do these things so I have a better view. All right, this is about centered, roughly speaking. And I can already see the purple color coming through beneath the gel skin. A little bit more here. And of course, this stuff dries clear, so I'm not terribly worried about moving anything to a place I don't want to. Okay. This is also where I tend to use my heat gun. Okay, first, a little bit more smoothing from the center. And I am impatient, what can I say? This helps speed along the process, especially if you live in a place like the Puget Sound region where it's quite often damp or humid.
keep it moving because if you keep it in one spot and then move it to another spot, you're going to burn whatever is underneath the heat gun. The nice thing about using the heat gun is that it also softens up the gel a little bit and makes it more likely to stick well to papers and the surface beneath. Okay. Ooh, look at all that pretty color. Okay. So I'm gonna pull this up. Move the tape that we're holding down the watercolor paper. Holding down the watercolor paper with removable tape is useful because it keeps it in place and also produces these nice clean lines when you remove it. And while you're working on it, the paper doesn't buckle quite as much when you put wet elements on it. Okay, so this is a rough idea of what you would be dealing with. All right, you see the color of the watercolor crayons comes through really strongly, um, especially in the spots where I was rubbing it in with my finger. But you can also see the patterns of the Japanese paper that I used, like the wave paper, and the deepness of this blue at the very bottom where the floor usually is. And if you look closely, you can even see those little firecrackers <laughs> and their paper underneath. And that's about it. Thank you very much for spending some time with me. Um, if you would like to get a list of the products that I used and the materials, the tools that I used, you can go to my bundle page on blick.com and that web address will be in the chat of this Zoom call. Um, if you would like to see more of my art, uh, more of my finished composed art, uh, there are a few options. Uh, this month, you can see some of my altered book work at the Vashon Center for the Arts in the Like Mother exhibit. It's a group exhibit. In June, I will have some work at Gallery One in Ellensburg, Washington. And then from now until July, you can still visit the work I have up at Wanawari, which is in the Central District of Seattle. Um, if you would like to look at other stuff that isn't on display, or if you're outside of the Washington State area, please go to mortonfineart.com. That's the gallery that represents me on the East Coast. Or you can go to my own website, lisamb.com. M like Mary, B like boy.com. Again, thank you so much for spending time with me. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned a few things. And if I don't see you in person anytime soon, I'll see you online. Bye-bye.